Hey all, welcome back to Organic Chemistry 1 with Tara and Ray. As with all our videos, before I get into the experiment, I'd like to start with some general safety. Hopefully by now, you can tell Tara is not properly prepared for lab. She has loose hair, baggy clothes, and no lab goggles. The one thing she does have correct is uh, closed toe shoes and pants. Tara in this clip seems to be well prepared for lab as she has her lab notebook, remember, don't bring your lab manual, a hair tie for her hair, as well as less baggy clothes. She also has a lab coat, which is optional, but very useful as it protects her clothes against any chemical spills Notice she also has lab goggles, which are provided to you in lab. Once she's fully prepared, she's ready to go and start. Before starting the experiment, she checks her lab notebook to see what's needed. Before grabbing any glassware or chemicals, she first grabs gloves before touching anything else in the lab. Once her gloves are on, she's ready to start. As for fire safety, the front of the lab will always have a fire extinguisher and a fire blanket to cover any flames. It's very accessible. There, Tara is showing you the spill kit. A quick refresher on the safety shower and eye wash. In the back of the room, there's an eye wash that's readily accessible. Pulling it down activates it. And if you have spilled any chemicals on you, there is a safety shower. There is a curtain for your privacy as well. If you break any glassware, please let your TA know ASAP. They will help you clean up the situation. Here, a bottle has spilled. Notice Tara is cleaning the area, making sure to sweep up in a wide range to ensure all glass is picked up. She then goes to the floor to get any glass that has been on the floor. Notice she does not directly kneel on the floor to prevent any glass from cutting into her clothes. Once she cleans up the mess, she will dispose of it. Here Tara brings it to the glass waste disposal, where she will empty it out and then return the cleaning supplies. So in today's lab, we'll be doing bromination of an alkene. It's a pretty straightforward lab, but before we get into it, I want to give a quick introduction and talk about the reaction and key points about it. So, you guys have already learned about this in your class most likely, but I want to point out a few things. So, the first thing I'd like to point out is in the bromination of an alkene, it's noticed that only antiproducts are observed. So what that basically means is that whenever she's looking at this reaction, it will follow a very predictable stereochemical pattern. For instance, in the reaction of cyclohexene with a bromine, the two bromine atoms add to opposite faces of the alkene, anti-stereochemistry. No syn products are observed. You can see the syn product in gray and the antiproduct in black. So that is what they are mentioning when I'm talking about anti and sin. The next thing I'd like to point out is that the stereochemistry of the starting alkene is directly related to the stereochemistry of the product. For instance, in the image below, if we treat cis-2-butene, aka Z-2-butene, with uh, bromide, we get a mixture of enantiomers. But if we treat trans 2 butene, we only get a single product, meso 2 3 dibromobutane, which itself is a diastereomer of SS 2 3 dibromobutane and RR 2 3 dibromobutane. These starting materials, cis butuene and trans butuene, which differ only in the configuration of the double bond, lead to stereoisomeric products. This type of process is given the name stereospecific. 
what's important about this, there's actually a few things. So first, given the product, it's possible to work backwards to figure out which isomer of cis-butuene was the starting material. Um, the second thing is that the fact this happens means the mechanism for this is inconsistent with a free carbocation. So if there was a free carbocation, the stereochemistry of the starting alkene would not matter since attack can come from either face. So I mentioned that there are no uh, carbocations observed. And the reason why this reaction is consistent with the absence of a free carbocation is because rearrangements are never observed. So an example on your screen, you can expect a rearrangement, so a one, two alkyl sh shift if a free carbocation was formed. However, after performing the reaction, note that the methyl group stays in the same place. So there is no rearrangements in bromination reactions. And the last thing I want to bring up is that certain solvents can actually affect the reaction products. So whatever solvent you're doing this reaction in does matter. For example, if we were to use water instead of methylene chloride, we would get the product shown below. So this product is called a bromohydrin. So what you notice is that there's the addition of an alcohol and we also have incorporated a bromine. I want to point out that the stereochemistry is still anti as before. So what this means is that somehow our solvent has intercepted a reactive intermediate in this reaction to produce the product above. And this also occurs whenever we use alcohols as solvents and in those cases an ether is obtained. So what's interesting is that the reaction is regioselective. So when we have an unsymmetrical alkene, the major product is the one where water has added to the most substituted carbon of the alkene. And just a refresher, most substituted equals the sp2 carbon of the alkene directly attached to the fewest hydrogen atoms. And this is so-called Markon, I can't, excuse me, Markonikov selectivity was also observed in the reactions that proceeded along the carbocation pathway. Now let's put everything together. So, essentially what's going on in this? We know that there's anti-stereochemistry observed, there's no carbocation intermediate, so stereospecific and no rearrangements, and it can be intercepted by a nucleophilic solvent attack occurs at the most substituted carbon of the original alkene. So what's the mechanism of this process? Essentially, it goes through a three-membered ring, and you can see that in the image below. So I'm not going to go in depth over this mechanism as this was done in class, but just know that essentially treating an alkene with Br2 results in a vicinal dibromide with the two bromines oriented anti to each other. And the key intermediate is a bromonium ion, which contains a positively charged three-membered ring. That three-membered ring gets attacked and then resulting in the stereochem being anti to each other. So that will help you answer your questions for this lab report as well as any exam questions. So hopefully this was all useful for you guys. Now I'm going to get into the safety before we start the experiment. So for safety, we're going to be working with ethanol today. You guys have worked with it plenty of times in this lab. As you know, flammable liquid and vapor causes eye irritation and serious damage to organs through continuous exposure. The still bean we were working with today has acute oral toxicity and can cause serious eye irritation. Pyridinium tribromide is harmful if swallowed, causes severe skin burns and eye damage, and can cause respiratory irritation. Uh, that has to do with the bromide forming when in solution. Um, we are making this experiment safer today by not using what's typically used. Uh, normally people use bromide and bromide gas is very volatile 
even the bromide solid, so it's not safe to work with. And we are substituting methylene chloride for ethanol. So typically this procedure is done with acetic acid, but acetic acid is also volatile. So we're using ethanol, which is a bit safer. So those are the changes in the procedure. These are all noted in your manual as well. So to start off this experiment, Tara is going to be weighing out 0.2 grams of e-stilbene into a 10 milliliter round bottom flask. Note that the mass is not perfectly 0 0.200. However, she is making sure that she's writing down the masses in her notebook to make any adjustments to future calculations. It's important to take good notes when performing the experiment. Now she's going to transfer the two around um, 200 milligrams of e stilbene into the round bottom flask. So notice that she has the flask in a stand and that she is not doing this in the hood. So the hoods are very powerful. So having paper inside of them, you can risk having basically the, the weighing boat fly up into the hood and blocking it. So that's why she is pouring it out here. To make sure she's ready for the step afterwards, she is now going to measure out 400 milligrams or 0.4 grams of pyridinium tribromide. Notice it has a very orange red color. So the reason we're using this chemical instead of uh, bromine is because this solid makes molecular bromine only when in solution. So, and very small amounts of it. So we don't have to worry about the safety precautions of using just solid bromide and having to worry about the volatile gas. Note that Taro is going to write the weight in her notebook. This is essential and should be practiced. So make sure you do this yourself when performing experiments. The weight doesn't have to be exactly what's mentioned in the manual, but close enough and any deviations need to be recorded. With everything weighed out, Tara has brought everything into the hood and is now going to add the two milliliters of 95% ethanol to the round bottom flask. She used a graduated cylinder to measure out the two mils and in order to be uh, accurate, she's using um, a pipette to 
add her ethanol. This allows her to wash the sides of the round bottom flask to ensure all the chemicals are fully dissolved in solution. Her flask also contains a stir bar as well as the ethanol and the e-still bean. Once that's added, notice that she's adding the pyridinium tribromide. So she's holding the weigh boat flask to ensure that it's not flying out into the hood. And she's using a spatula to add, make any additions. In order to ensure that all of the pyridinium tribromide is in solution, she's going to add up to two milliliters of ethanol to rinse the pyridinium tribromide to the bottom of the flask. Notice Tara already has a clamp set up to the side of her um, uh, round bottom flask. Here she's going to add an air condenser to reflux her reaction mixture. As you guys know, ethanol is our solvent, so using the, uh, the physical properties table, you should know what temperature to reflux your um, ethanol at. That's why this table is very important. Notice that it's extremely secure so there's no chance of the flask falling down. Here, Tara is going to set up the, the reaction by putting on this, uh, the magnetic stirrer as well as the heat in order to reflux the ethanol. She's going to reflux with stirring for a moment for five minutes. It's important to note that the color of the solution should turn from red to yellow during this time period. So once the solution starts refluxing, that is when you consider your start of your five minutes. Here you can see the reaction is bubbling and you can see that it's refluxing. You can see the ethanol condensing in the air condenser and dropping back into solution. Also note, the color of the reaction mixture is an orangish yellow color, a lot different than the bright red that it started off as. Once this refluxes for five minutes, um, the sample is going to be removed from the heat. Essentially, we're going to turn the tube off of the heat and let it cool down to room temperature. Now that the reaction has been refluxed for five minutes, Tara is going to allow it to cool. You can notice that once it's off the heat, it immediately starts crystallizing. You can see the solid at the bottom of the reaction flask in a moment once Tara turns the clamp around and attaches it back to the condenser. Once the solution is at room temperature, we will move on to the next step.
Now that the reaction has cooled to room temperature, we're going to move the flask to an ice bath and continue cooling for an additional 10 minutes. You can see the crystals. Notice in the ice bath we also have ethanol. We're preparing for the next step, which is going to be washing the isolated solid with ice cold ethanol to remove any absorbed pyridinium salts. Here Tara is setting up the Hirsch funnel to vacuum filtrate her product. So you're going to notice that the solution is still orange. Our, so our pro final product is actually white. So we're trying to wash away any of the remaining pyridinium bromide salts. So we're using ethanol because those salts are not soluble in this. You can see through filtration, our product is pretty much a pale white color and the orange solution is due to the pyridinium. Notice Tara is also washing everything with ethanol. She's going to also wash the flask to ensure that our yield is high. So using ethanol, she's rinsing the flask and then pouring everything out. Once you've washed your flask, you can, if there's a remaining time, you can actually leave your sample to um, dry even longer on the vacuum. This will help aid the drying process to make sure that your product is dry for the next steps in analysis. Remember, we will be doing IR analysis and melting point analysis. And having a dry product will ensure that our measurements are accurate. meaning we do not have the interference of water in our IR spectrums or in our melting point values. Once done filtering, Tara will transfer to another container and allow it to dry overnight. Then one day later, and the product is fully dried. So now Tara has a separate container where she's going to weigh it and transfer the sample. So it's important to do this first before doing any of the IR or melting point analysis because you want to ensure that you're calculating the correct yield. So make sure you weigh your product first so then you can determine your yield accurately. Pretty straightforward. So now that the sample has been weighed, Tara can go on and do her melting point analysis. As she's already introduced this technique before, I won't be going in depth, but here she's loading the capillary tube and making sure she has enough sample to get a good reading. And now she's tapping her sample to the bottom of the tube. You can use this to assist you in tapping down the sample. Now for the melting point analysis. You should have an initial idea of what the melting point of the final product should be due to the physical properties table. So once again, I'm just bringing up why this table is important because it will help you look for certain things during your experiment. 
And here you can just observe the melting and then record the actual melting point of the final product. And you can clearly see it's still a solid, but in a few moments it will turn into a liquid and have a significant color change. With the melting point analysis done, now we can collect our IR. You guys have seen this many times before, but just a quick refresher, Tower is cleaning the pedestal and ensuring that there is no other contaminants on it. Please always do this when taking any IR samples. Now Tara will collect her background spectrum first, and once that background is collected, she can then take the spectrum of her sample. Remember, you do not have to collect the background sample, you just have to take the reading. And remember, when measuring out the sample, only use enough to cover the pedestal. And to make cleanup easier, please use the paper as well. Do not over tighten it as well. After your measurement is taken, ensure that you find peaks so you can label the peaks. This is essential for you to identify everything and, char and properly characterize your molecule. Once you're done collecting your data, always clean up the IR. So you either would use isopropanol or methanol to clean up the product that is on the pedestal. And always use Kim wipes to ensure that there is no lint left on the pedestal. Once you're finished up with the IR, then proceed to clean up the rest of your reaction. The first thing is dumping the ice bath. As long as nothing is spilled in, you can dump the water down the sink and ensure that the ice bath is put back to dry. Once that's done, you can clean up any of your silverware or spatula. Here, notice there's still some pyridinium uh, tribromide. So Tara will use some methanol to rinse it into the waste beaker. And then also any extra ethanol that she has will be poured into the waste beaker as well. Here she's using uh, acetone to clean all the glassware that she used today.
Finally, once you've rinsed everything with acetone and allowed it to dry, please rinse everything with water. The reason why is to ensure that there is no compounds remaining on the glassware and it's clean for the next person to use. You can rinse everything with water only after you've rinsed it with acetone and dumped it into the waste bin. This ensures that there is no organic compounds going into the sink. 